Hi, my name is Jeremy Lentz, and I'm author of a couple of books the last few years, one called The Patterning Instinct, one called The Web of Meaning. And I'm currently writing a book on the vision and um, potential um, potentiality of an ecological civilization, which is what I'll be sharing with you in this presentation today, along with what an ecological civilization might look like in the realm of education. So uh, to begin with, let me share my screen. And so here's a presentation, Envision Envisioning Education in an Ecological Civilization. Uh, to begin with, we can ask ourselves why we um, need an ecological civilization itself in the first place. Why do we need something different from what we have right now? And I think probably all of you have a very clear sense of what that is. So let's begin by just contemplating the earth, our only home, the only place we know of in the universe where life exists. <clears throat> and life on this beautiful planet began quite early in the planet's history, billions of years ago. And it took a big portion of that time to develop the rich complexity <clears throat> that we enjoy today. But it's only been the last 100,000 years or so that one particular species arose that had the ability to actually change the very system of the Earth itself, the very way in which <clears throat> this incredible planet works. And of course, that species is us. And <clears throat> we should ask ourselves, what kind of job are we doing? And we know only too well, the answer is abysmal. We know the wildfires, floods, and droughts existing, going worse and worse around the world are harbingers of climate breakdown this century. And that um, organizations like the IPCC has issued calls saying final warning to humanity, we've got to make changes drastically and nothing is getting changed. But here's the thing, even if climate breakdown itself could somehow magically be fixed by some sort of silver bullet, it's only really the symptom of a deeper underlying problem, which is the vast ecological devastation our civilization is causing on the earth today. Just a few statistics, <clears throat> just to sort of ground ourselves in what we're talking about. Um, there's been a 73% in animal populations worldwide in just the last 50 years alone. And we're looking at the uh, likely end of coral reefs all around the world by the middle of this century um, because of human causation. And, and even the beginning of the sixth extinction of species, and the, only the sixth time in those billions of years of life on Earth that there's been a mass extinction, um, only this one caused by one species, ourselves. So a reasonable question to ask ourselves is, how did we get to this terrible place? And that's something I studied in that book I wrote some years back, called The Patterning Instinct, A Cultural History If Humanity's Search for Meaning. I'm not going to take you through the details of that book, but one thing that distilled, one thing that arose from that book, um, I think is crucial, is the simple reality that culture shapes values, and those values shape history. And by the same token, today's values will shape the future. So what are today's values? Well, I think this picture kind of captures what we're really talking about. Uh, the dominant values of the civilization, of the dominant civilization today, are basically based on separation. Here, these people are separate from each other, connected with their technology, separate even from the food they're about to eat, not even thinking where it might have come from. And if we go one layer lower <clears throat> to look at the details below this kind of um, story of separation, we see that it looks something like this. Um, in all the media and all the things that people just take for granted around the world. <clears throat> it's like nature is a machine. Humans are separate from nature. Humans are essentially selfish and competitive and separate from each other. Human progress rises from the conquest of nature. The earth is a resource to exploit for human benefit. And the purpose of life is basically to get wealthy and powerful. Now, although this view of human nature and human place in the, uh, in the world 
is pretty much ubiquitous around the world today. It only emerged in one place and time in all of human history, in early modern Europe, around the time and a causation of, in many ways, the scientific revolution in the 17th century. And it was really well described by this kind of prophet of the scientific age, Francis Bacon, when he talked about this possibility to, in his words, establish and extend the power of dominion of the human race itself over the universe and to render ourselves the masters and possessors of nature. And the Europeans, as we know, <clears throat> took that idea of conquering nature to heart. And they not only believed that it was their right to conquer nature, but also their right to conquer other continents too, which led to <clears throat> this outburst of colonialism uh, starting around that time until the Europeans got to dominate virtually, virtually every part of the world. And if we follow what arose from that worldview of separation in Europe around that time, we can see that it led <clears throat> um, the people of that time to see nature as a resource and for the Europeans to see other people as resources. We see that it led to this sense of human supremacy, that humans have some kind of innate moral right to do whatever they want to the rest of life on earth. And <clears throat> because this worldview came from those white European, mostly male Christians at that time, it also led to the sense of white supremacy, that somehow there was something innately superior about the white-skinned Europeans who uh, went out there and conquered the rest of the world. That led to these core values of extraction and exploitation, <clears throat> which um, really uh, led to what we experience now, the domination of the world by global capitalism. And in fact, we can understand capitalism itself, which arose around the same time in Europe as being like the economic manifestation of those values of extraction and exploitation <clears throat> um, going throughout our economy. That has led, as you probably well know, to the greatest inequality in history, where right now the wealthiest couple of dozen billionaires own as much wealth as half the world's population of 4 billion people. And global capitalism is based on an inherently unsustainable set of core design principles. Things like maximize shareholder returns, keep growing at all costs, and viewing material consumption as a proxy of welfare and non-human nature as a resource to exploit, which leads to this extractive directive to monetize everything as fast as possible, to turn humans into conditioned consumers and to exploit every available resource on the earth. And this system so far has been doing an incredibly effective job of exactly that. And you may be aware of what earth scientists call the great acceleration. When they look at pretty much every measure of production or consumption since the Second World War, you can see it exploding in this way. And it continues to do so. Um, economists, mainstream economists project a tripling of this level of production and consumption and extraction and exploitation from now to roughly the middle of this century. And so from that, we're rapidly heading for a precipice. And Johan Rockström and, and the Stockholm Resilience Institute some years back created a model to try to determine the safe operating space for humanity. They identified nine dimensions of that safe operating space and we've blown through already six of those nine, which is why scientists are putting out warnings to humanity, saying soon it'll be too late to shift course from our failing trajectory, that there's a very big risk will end our civilization. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres calls it collective suicide. So where are we headed this century? Well, what's pretty clear, and by pretty much anyone who looks at this question, is that we're undergoing this century as big a transformation in every aspect of the human experience as those that were experienced only a couple of times in all of human history, from when we went from being nomadic hunter-gatherers to agriculture, which a process that began around 10,000 years ago, and then when the scientific revolution basically transformed the world, beginning roughly 400 years ago. The question is, if we know we're undergoing this massive transformation century, where is it going to take us to? 
Well, I think we can distill three <clears throat> basic scenarios from that. One is <clears throat> basically total collapse, a devastating scenario that would lead to mega deaths and <clears throat> the worst suffering, the worst human suffering ever really experienced um, in the human species history, something to avoid at all costs if possible. Another scenario, which in some ways may be viewed as even more morally egregious is this kind of notion of a fortress earth where um, there's a split between the elites who basically keep most of the world out of their enclaves of high-tech exploration of what it means to be in touch with AI and, um, and get neurally connected with their computers and explore transhumanism and all that stuff, while most of the world experiences essentially some kind of collapse. The question is, can we <clears throat> transform the world to one that actually leads to a long trajectory of sustainable flourishing? That's obviously what all of us <clears throat> here today uh, want to see. And increasingly people are calling that, that vision of a transformed, sustainable, vibrant future, an ecological civilization. And it would require basically changing the entire operating system of our world, of the dominant civilization right now, moving from capitalism to moving one that began with an affirmation of life. So what is an ecological civilization? It's that transformation from a system that is wealth-based to one that is life-based. <clears throat> it's basically a global, cultural, and economic system that could promote sustainable flourishing for humans and the earth. And the overriding objective of that system will be to create the conditions for all people to flourish as part of a thriving living earth. And this vision of moving to that life-affirming future is one that in one way or other is shared by a vast array of different groups working and fighting towards that life-affirming future. And we see that in indigenous uh, models for life-affirming values like Buen Vivir, Sumac Corsé or Ubuntu. And we see that in permaculture principles, the rights of nature movement, in transition towns, in theories of the commons, the degrowth movement, in um, the incredibly powerful movement of agroecology, spiritual movements like deep ecology, the earth charter, and other spiritual movements like engaged Buddhism, Christian liberation theology, um, and then economic and political movements like anti-globalization, eco-socialism, um, LGBTQ rights movements, all these different <clears throat> heterogeneous groups are all trying to move towards that positive, life-affirming civilization. And if we take a look at what an, eco an ecological civilization might actually uh, mean, we can recognize that it's based on the principles of life itself. <clears throat> based on really what allows ecosystems to thrive um, resiliently for sometimes millions of years. And one of the basic principles of that <clears throat> is that nature is not actually selfish. We're told by mainstream concepts <clears throat> that that's the case, that there's a selfish gene. <clears throat> but in fact, when evolutionary biologists look at the history of the increased complexity of life over billions of years, there's only been a few times that there's been this jump in complexity to complex cells, multicellular life, simple animals, mammals. And every one of those arose not through some species learning out how to outcompete the others, but how to increase cooperation. Life essentially evolved through cooperation. In the words of systems biologist Lynn Margulis, Life did not take over the world by combat, but by networking. And humans, <clears throat> when hominids evolved in uh, just the last few million years, and Homo sapiens just the last 100,000 or so years, that also <clears throat> arose from a significant increase, not in competition, but in cooperation. Humans evolved to be cooperative. Early hominids, when they found themselves on the savanna in the Great Rift Valley, were vulnerable to predators. Those who learned to collaborate were the most successful. And over millions of years, <clears throat> our hominid ancestors' identity expanded from self and kin to include the entire group. 
So that human ability to cooperate with each other, even those who are not kin, is what differentiates us from other primates. And over those millions of years, we developed what social psychologists call moral emotions. Things like compassion, guilt, shame, gratitude, embarrassment. And those are things we feel in our gut. And so we don't just act morally because we think we should to overcome our selfish genes, whatever it might be. We do so because it feels right. <clears throat> and indigenous cultures around the world have always understood that. As I'm sure you know, um, in Sub-Saharan Africa, there's this core predominant um, concept of Ubuntu, which basically translates as I am because you are. In North America, where I, I live, um, the Lakota tribe have this concept of mitakuye oyasin, we are all related. And they're referring not just to each other there, but all of life around them. And so what would it mean to understand what are some of these principles of ecosystems um, and how could that be applied to human society? So I'll take you through some of those um, just really briefly to get a, a sense, a survey of what that might look like. Well, the first and most crucial is the one I've touched on already of mutually beneficial symbiosis, where each party gains from a reciprocal relationship. And, and applied to human society, it would lead to core concepts like fairness, justice, equity, and individual dignity for all. Another crucial part of ecosystems is that nature is always a holarchy where every part um, is part of a greater whole um, around it that it's part of. And <clears throat> if you look at what that holarchy means for an ecosystem as a whole, is that the health of the whole system requires the flourishing of each part within it. And it's uh, <clears throat> something that um, sometimes we can term fractal flourishing. And that would equally apply to human societies where the health of the whole um, of a human civilization or society requires the flourishing of each part within it. Ecosystems thrive through diversity, where a system's health depends on differentiation and integration. And if applied to human systems, that would mean the inherent right of each person and community within a society to participate in cultural, political, and economic power. Then there's balance. Every part <clears throat> of a healthy ecosystem is in a harmonious relationship with the entire system. This could lead to a steady state economy with equitable distribution of wealth and power. Then there's subsidiarity, um, which we can think of as grassroots self-autonomy. Here we literally see these um, <clears throat> the grassroots. And the point about that is that in and a healthy ecosystem, every part of that system is doing its own thing. We're pushing decision-making down to the lowest possible level in the system. And there's the sense of embeddedness, recognizing humanity as being part of the natural world and tending Mother Earth rather than trying to control her. And finally, there's the principle of regeneration a sense of sustainable flourishing into the long-term future, well described by the constitution of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. Um, in our every deliberation, we must consider the impact of our decisions on the next seven generations. So if we <clears throat> like roll this out and think, what could a future a global civilization look like in practice? The part of the expansiveness of this vision is that it doesn't just apply to changing our economy, but every aspect of what we have right now is our global dominant system. Things like um, distribution of wealth, technology, infrastructure, governance, culture, community, education, symbiosis with the living earth. And for right now, <clears throat> um, I'm not going to go into all of the details, but this is what I'm basically writing this book about is to look at really exciting um, areas where different groups are already um, making inroads, developing their ideas for what an ecological civilization could look like. And when we weave them all together, we see a coherent vision of a possible future. But in this presentation, let's just focus um, now on education. 
and what we what we can think of, how we could reconceive education as part of that movement toward a life affirming future. Well, <clears throat> um, as many of you are well aware, the mainstream school system is really designed not to um, educate people in what might be life affirming, but basically to instill alienation and obedience. <clears throat> Something that uh, the um, education expert Paolo Freire called the banking model of education. It's passive, hierarchical, and rote. <clears throat> it uses a curriculum dictated from a centralized authority, competitive grading of skills with course material broken into subjects and hours and students reduced to passive obedience, having to take notes, memorize, regurgitate what the teacher wants on the exams. Basically, this system is designed to churn out uncritical workers. And not surprising when we recognize that the modern school system is basically based on the military model. As I'm sure many of you are aware, it first developed in the Republic of Prussia, a quasi-military state, and really best described by um, this philosopher of education at the time, Johann Gottlieb Fichte, um, who talked about how education should aim at destroying free will so that after the school, uh, people will be incapable through the rest of their lives of thinking or acting otherwise as their schoolmasters would have wished. And <clears throat> of course, we see um, that's exactly what they <clears throat> succeeded in doing in Prussia, turning those students into a military machine. And, and they applied these kinds of concepts to education, which then became standardized throughout basically what we know as mainstream education today, ideas of surveillance and control, a prescribed national curriculum, regular testing, state certification for teachers. And while we haven't lost um, in our dominant education system today, some of those basic parameters for that, um, basically that mi military model of education, um, what we've seen now in recent decades with neoliberal dominance is it's also been driven into a market-driven uh, educational system. Basically, like there's a global education industry driven by the private sector organizations and businesses that's valued at trillions of dollars with rapid growth of online learning, tech giants now shaping educational policy and delivery. Um, and along with that comes this global testing culture of competitiveness, fostering a sense of competition for every student against other people around them along with homogenization and standardization, with the underlying premise that education now should be something institutionally that should serve a growth-oriented economy. So part of moving towards that vision of an ecological civilization is to re-envision the purpose of education. So it's something like this, to basically to cultivate the discernment, emotional maturity, and wisdom required for each student to embark on a lifelong journey to fulfill their unique potential and contribute to the health of their community, society, and the living earth. And to, to get a sense of what that might mean, what we're really looking at is things like a pro-social education, developing innate human tendencies, eco-literacy and systems thinking, an embodied education with holistic learning, self-directed education, fostering creative expression and a community orientation. And I'll just take us through a moment to look at each of these just a little bit more. So that idea of a pro-social education is to develop the innate human collaborative tendencies that could reshape the patriarchal and competitive cultural conditioning by emphasizing pro-social values, build social and emotional skills like empathy, mindfulness, compassion, and resilience, <clears throat> really beautifully expressed in uh, the concept of convivencia, the art of living together. Uh, collaborative team-based learning environments, engaging students in their own questions and aspirations, and to develop participatory and democratic values for consensual decision-making. If we move to the idea of eco-literacy and systems thinking, what that's really about is to understand 
core ecological principles as a mental model for all aspects of life and society, allowing students to develop a reverence for life with nature-based learning, sort of cultivating stewardship of whatever our kids um, see around them in their local neighborhood, as sometimes called, and to recognize human embeddedness within the earth systems, ultimately to learn to understand complex interrelationships and systems dynamics. Another core principle <clears throat> would be embodied education, fostering holistic learning, <clears throat> recognizing that education is far more effective when it's embodied rather than relying solely on the intellect. And a learning that exercises the full range of human faculties, rational and cognitive, experiential, intuitive, embodied, relational, and creating spaces that welcome creativity, playfulness, experimentation, passion, and tears. <clears throat> and a crucial aspect is a focus on self-directed education, instilling creative expression, basically allowing children to learn through their own evolved curiosity. That could mean unschooling at home, or it could mean developing democratic schools. <clears throat> Um, like unschooling at home uh, can offer a rich context and support for self-directed learning, can replace curriculum assignments and tests. As uh, Loris Malaguzzi, <clears throat> who was a key thinker for unschooling, so as children can be authors of their own learning. And democratic schools um, really refer to this notion of educational freedom, true democratic governance by the students. Um, and, and instilling a sense of personal responsibility where the school members themselves, the students themselves can hire and fire the staff. And there have been some exciting, successful models of this kind of democratic school, like the Sudbury Valley School in Massachusetts in the US, the Reggio Emilia model in Italy and the Agora School in the Netherlands. Then, and this has something that can truly in, in, inspire improved learning and well-being and flourishing in adult life. So unschooling has been shown um, by studies that that is the outcome to be expected. Then there's a notion of re-envisioning schools as a learning community, where students basically can become leaders in building healthy communities beyond the school. And of course, um, ecoversities is a part of that movement towards that, along with another group and who call themselves com universities students and staff working side by side cleaning and maintaining the buildings together growing food cooking and washing dishes and um, like places like swaraj university and barefoot college in Rajasthan, and the leap schools in south africa are great inspiring pioneers of this kind of approach to schooling and this would lead to schools becoming basically centers for vibrant community life and intergenerational learning. So <clears throat> with those kinds of approaches to education, those are the kinds of things that as we move forward generations um, towards that potential for life-affirming future, that's what can help humanity basically build a planetary consciousness. And just maybe in the face of all the negative scenarios we're looking at, just maybe if enough of us can connect together with that shared vision of a positive life-affirming future, maybe we can regenerate our beautiful planet. And perhaps <clears throat> um, as uh, described by the eco, by eco-philosopher Greg Olbrecht, we can move from the Anthropocene to the Symbiocene. We know what the Anthropocene is, right? It's where we're experiencing right now, this era where under the ideology of human supremacy, where human impact has reached geological proportions. It's destroying life and biodiversity, and it's inherently unsustainable. The notion of the symbiocene would be an era based on the principle of symbiosis with the mutual beneficial flourishing of humans and the living earth, where technology is used, but for regenerative and life-affirming practices. And this could be an era that could potentially be very long lived as we become a civilization learning how to tend Mother Earth 
So thank you for sharing that with me. And thank you for what you're doing in the work you're participating in as part of that vision towards that life affirming future. And if you want to find out any more about my own work, and um, you can go to these books I've written, The Patterning Instinct and The Web of Meaning. And I invite you also to join us, um, thousands of us from around the world in an online network called the Deep Transformation Network. We basically are a global community exploring pathways toward an ecological civilization at that website, www.deeptransformation.network. Thank you very much. <laughs>